It's a great pleasure to welcome today's speakers, Katie Swaha and Elizabeth Payne. Um, for me, they're great examples of the many ways that the humanities can help us understand and solve complex societal problems. We're gonna need their superpowers of imagination, reflection, persuasion, and so much more. At UMaine, we've been very fortunate to have many outstanding faculty come and speak from all over campus, uh, representing such diverse humanistic fields as philosophy, history, Native American studies, communication, sociology, and art. Um, but I think this is the first time we've heard from faculty in English and uh, I know we're in for a treat. I'm confident that Katie and Elizabeth in particular can not only help us create new stories about our world, but also find better ways of working together to create a better world. For universities, we often need to begin by meeting communities where they are and asking, how can we do a better job of listening to one another given our many differences? And how can we make shared decisions and take joint actions knowing that complete agreement or mutual understanding may never be possible? Katie's been a pioneer in community engaged research an approach that I believe holds great promise for strengthening our democracy. And Elizabeth has a strong focus on the ethical dimensions of sustainability and engineering, which are, to be honest, uh, we could get better at. I say that as a sustainability scientist. Um, they're also both actively training the next generation of leaders and problem solvers in technical and professional writing, which is really an invaluable resource for building durable community university partnerships. Please join me in welcoming Katie and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for David, um, to David and everyone here at the Mitchell Center for making this talk a possibility and for inviting us. We're really excited to be here today. Um, so as David just said, you know, you might be thinking what do two English professors <laughs> have to contribute to a discussion um, on sustainability. And I think just the fact that we're here really speaks to one of the goals of this series, which this is a quote from the Sustainability Talks um, website that one of the goals is to really think about the value of connecting different forms of knowledge and know-how and efforts to understand and solve sustainability problems. So, you know, sustainability for either of us is not our main area of research, but it's something that we're really interested in. And it's something that we work in sort of tangentially and we think <laughs> that some of the stories and, and theory that we talk about today um, is really you know, part of, of these collaborative efforts towards sustainability solutions. So thank you for inviting us to be here. Let me just make sure that we can advance our slides. Okay. So what will we discuss today? So just a brief roadmap of our talk. I'm first gonna just talk about some backward background terminology that we're gonna to use today. Just some definitions about wicked problems, deliberation, sustainability, all terms you've probably heard. So I'll just briefly run through the way that we're gonna be thinking about them today. Then I'll introduce a theoretical framework from my field of technical communication, which is called rhetorical ecologies. I won't say too much more about it now, but we'll talk about that. Then I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, and she's going to talk about the history of Lake Wesseronset. So we're going to be using <coughs> Elizabeth's work with Lake Wesseronset, excuse me, as sort of a case study or an, an extended example of some of the more theoretical terms that we're going to introduce. And so she'll talk about that a bit. She has an extended example of a watershed conservation plan that she'll explain. She has a few other examples that she'll talk about. And these are gonna be really on the ground examples of work, sustainability work that um, the LWA, the Lake West Ronset Association has been doing. And then we'll do some takeaways. So that's where we're going. So first, what are wicked problems? I'm sure everyone has heard this term. Um, a definition, very simple definition that I like is problems that cannot be easily addressed. 
very simply, <laughs> simple but complex, right? Because they are intertwined with so many other issues. Um, and I that's a paraphrase, but it comes from this book, Tackling Wicked Problems Through a Transdisciplinary Imagination. So what I really like about that is sort of recognizing that these problems are not gonna be solved by one field, by one discipline, by one area of work. We're gonna to have to work together. And I know the Mitchell Center firmly believes that, right? Um, so as I'm sure you all know and can imagine, basically all of the problems faced at the lake in terms of sustainability and conservation are wicked problems, problems that need collaboration and different types of solutions. What is democratic deliberation? So I think in the ways that wicked problems are discussed in public discourse and public conversation, we oftentimes also have this idea of democratic deliberation, which has been defined as thoughtful and reasoned consideration of information, views, experiences, and ideas among a group of individuals that leads to a well-reasoned solution to a shared problem. And this definition comes from a book um, called Democracy in Motion, Evaluating the Practice and Impact of Deliberate, Deliberative Civic Engagement. So I purposely put some of these terms in green here because I wanted to sort of have us just keep in the back of our mind the emphasis here on thoughtful and reasoned. There's a, a big emphasis in this definition on reason, um, which just let that sink in for a minute and I'm gonna sort of expand on that um, in a couple minutes. So I'll just let that definition sink in for now. And then at the last minute, I actually added this question of what is sustainability? <laughs> we're all here, so I'm sure we're interested in this idea in some way, but I know for, for us, we don't often take a pause and think about, well, what is it? And what are, how are we defining it, right? We all potentially do work in this area, but sometimes get so sort of in the thick of things that we don't take a step back and say, okay, well, what is sustainability? Well, I found one very interesting definition, the Miriam, and you know, in English, we like to think about definitions and what they might mean. Um, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, if you just type in sustainability, which is a noun, of course, but the first definition that the Merriam-Webster dictionary will give you is capable of being sustained, which is actually an adjective. So, and I found that definition to be interesting for two reasons. First in form, just because of its simplicity, but also I found it somewhat hopeful, capable of being sustained. So if it sort of made me think if something is capable of being sustained, then it can be sustained, <laughs> right? Now the hard work of figuring out how to do that is, is partly why we're all here, right? But I, I just found that definition to be very hopeful. Um, and then, of course, you, many of you might be familiar with the United Nations definition of sustainability, which is much more specific, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is how the United Nations defines sustainability. And I, again, I just wanted to put those up there to have in the back of our minds as we talk about what sustainability work might mean at something like a local lake association. And then the second term I think is again, important just to have in the back of our mind is conservation. And again, I just went to Merriam Webster dictionary and, and I found this interesting because conservation is defined as a careful preservation and protection of something. So we have preservation becoming conservation when it's a careful preservation. And again, I just thought that was interesting and potentially hopeful when we think about, about this work. Okay, 
So now to more to the heart of our talk, you might be wondering what does all this have to do with lake associations? And this slide shows the homepage of the specific lake association that we'll be talking about today, which is the Lake Wesseruntset Association. And then I'm gonna be turning it over to Elizabeth in just a minute who, and she'll provide a lot more context on this specific lake and, and her work with this specific lake association. Um, but just suffice it to say for now, that our talk today is built around the premise that a lot of the really important work around wicked problems, sustainability, conservation, and a lot of the deliberation that has to happen to make that work possible is happening at very local sort of everyday levels at organizations like the Lake Wesser Onset Association. And essentially this is a group of people who all own property or live at this lake. Um, and, and Elizabeth and I have been talking a lot in preparing for this talk about how a lot of the public discourse, you know, what you hear on the news about sustainability tends to focus on the really big organizations or the really big initiatives, right? Like we hear about the EPA or we might have heard about the UN's upcoming climate change conference, right? And those are certainly really important, but they're really big. Um, and we think equally important in addressing wicked problems around sustainability and conservation is the everyday work of organizations like this, where as the homepage sort of suggests um, with their tagline there, preserving our lake because it's home, these problems, these sustainability conservation problems um, at an organization like the Lake Association, those problems are very personal. They're very embodied. They're very felt, they're very lived. So working with this association to, would probably mean that you have some kind of very felt, emotional, potentially historical, personal connection to that place and to that space. And Elizabeth will talk about that a little bit more, but we think that that is really important and it's not that sort of very personal connection to these issues is something that we that is not often made visible in the larger public discourse about sustainability. So basically what we're going to try to do today is connect some of these larger academic concepts like we just saw with the more definitional slides with really concrete everyday stories and examples from Elizabeth's work with the Lake Besseronset Association. And we're really going to try to center that more everyday personal action. So finally, what's in the field of technical communication ads? So as, as David mentioned, we're both in the English department and our specific subfield within English is technical communication, which very loosely defined is just examining how technical information of any kind, so sustainability information, scientific information, health information, how that is communicated in different ways to various audiences. So my specialty is actually in health communication. Elizabeth does a lot of work with engineering communication and we're very interested in how that communication is structured, how, it's, how it is shaped and who shapes it and structures it, um, who are the audiences for it. And you might begin to imagine what a field like that might contribute um, to these issues of conservation and sustainability. I think to really answer this question, we have to look at a few traditional models of technical communication. So these are I'm going to run through just a few ways that technical communication has been sort of thought of and theorized. And then we're going to look at that and then sort of look at, at a newer model that we want to build from. So for a long time, technical communication really relied on what's called the deficit model. And some of you might be familiar with this. So this is sort of the idea that there's scientific knowledge that's sort of in the heads of experts. <laughs> at a place here like UMaine, and our job as technical communicators is just to translate that scientific information sort of into the empty containers of the public. And it's this sort of unidirectional idea, just give the public this technical scientific information, just translate it for them. And that idea, to be honest, has not carried much theoretical weight in the field for a long time. Um, but I think in practice, it still is often the case where we sort of just have this idea if we can just give people the information, then, then they'll understand it or and we'll be able to, to do something with it. 
Um, a second sort of more traditional model is what I call the document model. And this is the idea that, you know, that we have some kind of driving documents. So a conservation plan, for example, or a big grant or a big study, some kind of really big document that drives our action and tells us what we need to do, a law for example. Um, and a lot of the work we do in teaching courses in technical communication is we focus on how to write such documents, right? To make sure that they're clear and concise and well-structured, informative. Do they have headings that make sense? Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna trouble that, that model a little bit in our talk today. You know, this idea that we just need the big document and it's gonna tell us what to do. It's gonna lead to action. <coughs> And then finally, the, the field has been shifting more over the past decade or so toward what's called a participatory model, which is the idea that we have scientific knowledge and scientific experts, but they should always be in conversation with the public and that that conversation should go both ways, right? That the public has knowledge and information to contribute back to scientific experts in sort of a multi-directional in a multi-directional way so that it's more of a conversation, right? And now all of these models do still come into play and I think they can all be useful in certain situations, um, yet none of them really capture exactly the type of communication and deliberation that we see happening at local lake associations. Um, and that's partly, I think, because all of these models suggest sort of discrete entities or stakeholders or groups, right? So we have like this idea of the public as if that's just one thing, or the idea of scientific experts as if that's one sort of cohesive entity. And we're gonna troubleshoot that a little bit here. And I think also with these models, we have a very linear idea of how information flows. So even in our participatory model, we have this idea that information should flow between scientific experts and public audiences, but it's still a straight line. You know, and it's the, of course, all models are, are reductive in some way, but this image I have here just shows, you know, sort of a linear transfer of information between two groups. So we think, and, and we will try to show that that's a little bit too neat in terms of how communication deliberation about these issues actually happens on an everyday level. So the model that we are going to talk about today and that we find more useful for understanding what's happening with sort of everyday organizations like the Lake Association is what's known as the rhetorical ecology model. And in my field, the term ecology is really being used as a metaphor, um, but I think it's apt, of course, for this audience as well. And basically what this model suggests is that um, it's a theory that's trying to understand communication more as a complex ecology of interrelated stakeholders, processes, influences, interactions. So you can see this as not linear. Um, and this, visu this visual is still <laughs> very reductive, but what I've tried to show is just some of the many actors in a larger ecology that can all affect deliberation and communication about sustainability at the lake. So you can see here, I have not just one lake association, but two, and I think there could even be more versions of the lake association, right? Like we might have some of the old guard folks in the lake association, and we might have some newer members who have different ideas, right? Or we might have some other folks who think of the lake association as something completely different. And Elizabeth can be talking about that a little bit. You know, what is the lake association even? It's not just one cohesive <laughs> bubble per se. Um, and then we have things like short-term visitors, um, official plans like the watershed plan, which Elizabeth is gonna talk about, which is sort of a very official document. But then we also have things like citizen science. We also have things like people's emotional connection to the lake. And the idea is that all of these stakeholders or entities or whatever you wanna call them are all contributing to the ways that we communicate, we deliberate about what's going to happen with something like sustainability at the lake. And then we can add even more. 
So I added generational family history, a walk at the lake, chance encounters, memories, the loon population. Um, so we have the actual physical space at the lake and the, and the flora and fauna who are there um, beyond the humans, informational kiosks. And, and I could add many, many more and Elizabeth will sort of be touching on different actors or factors or entities that are all a part of how deliberation and communication happens sort of in this everyday way about really important sustainability questions, wicked problems. Um, and Elizabeth will expand on this a lot more. So also in this model, like any ecology, we have the idea that communication does not just move linearly in one direction, but it's rather always ever changing and always in motion. So with sometimes communication might move sort of more circularly <laughs> or recursively where you sort of have fits and starts and then have to go back and revise and start again. So it's not just this neat, I have information, I'm gonna give it to you and then we're gonna take action. But it's, it's more messy than that. It's more complicated than that. And that's exactly what this model tries to do is sort of account for some of that messiness. It does not do so in order to have us all throw up our hands and say, this is too messy. <laughs> Where's the action? What can we do? It might feel like that um, sometimes, but rather this way of, of thinking about communication purposefully tries to highlight that messiness so that we can understand the many different factors that might go into something like deliberating or making decisions so that we can take actions and recognize both big actions like something like a watershed plan and the smaller actions that might not seem as important, like a walk between neighbors at a lake or a chance encounter, which Elizabeth will talk about a little bit. Those are often sort of missed when we talk about deliberation. Um, but as you'll see through some of Elizabeth's examples, some of those more chance encounters can actually really affect sustainability actions. Um, so sort of in summary, this model thinks of communication as emergent, so always emerging, always happening, distributed among many different factors and actors, not just discrete um, players, so to say, embodied, that we all communicate in embodied, in bodies and in embodied ways. Recursive, like I already talked about, it can have fits and starts and not just going from point A to point B. Affective, which is another way to say emotional. The folks have emotional connections to this lake and that's something that is important and does matter. And if you sort of think back to that definition of deliberation from earlier that I said we were gonna troubleshoot a little bit, that definition was very much focused on reason. And we're not saying to throw reason out, but this motto would say, well, reason and, inter and emotion are intertwined, right? And if we're going to deliberate about something in a reasonable way and use reason, we can't separate that from emotion. Emotion is also going to play a part because we're humans with bodies and emotions. Um, Nonlinear, I already talked about, and material. We're talking about a real material place. Okay, so I am now gonna turn it over to Elizabeth who's going to put some more life into this abstract theoretical concept. And she's gonna talk about several extended examples from her work at the lake that I think really shows this model in action. And then we'll conclude with some takeaways. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, David, for having me. I've been uh, attending these talks for, I don't know, four or five years. And uh, I'm very uh, honored to be on this side of the podium. So thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone who makes this uh, this happened. Um, I was watching you with your hands and I'm not sure what you, seems to be this, like this goes forward. Okay. Okay, so I hope that my example of uh, our Lake Association work will illustrate Katie's uh, rhetorical ecology model. Um, but first I'm gonna give you a little bit of context. Um, Lake Wessel-Runset has a, a very rich history and um, quite a lot of development on its shores. So the picture on the left is uh, a picture of uh, Lakewood Theater. And uh, it was founded at the turn of the 20th century. 
and quite a lot of developments sprung up around it. Um, it uh, is the oldest summer stock theater in the country. A trolley ran to it from Skowhegan uh, and many, many famous actors performed there. The picture on the right is a postcard from about 1938. And um, it has a lot of interesting details in, in it. Uh, right smack in the middle, I don't know if you can see it right here. It's the old, an old hotel that used to be on the, the Western shore. Um, there's a float plane out there. But the part that interests me the most is this giant shoreline, which does not exist today. And the reason why there's this big shoreline is it's the result of drawdown from um, a mill in East Madison, a woolen mill. Um, and they would draw the lake down so severely uh, that sometimes there would be fish kills on the lake. We have a member of the association who's a historian who's been on the lake his whole life. He's about 80 now. Um, and uh, so he has, uh, you know, memories of, of uh, the, the woolen mill and uh, what life was like that. And one of the points I want to make is that there have always been environmental issues uh, on the lake for as long as there have been people on it. Um, other kinds of development on the lake. Um, it's about a one mile by two mile long lake and uh, I think 1400 acres. It's about 25 feet deep. So it's not a very big lake, but it has uh, the Scowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture on it. That's a post-World War II um, campus. And uh, it was built on an old farmstead. And it has about 60 students a year attend from all over the world, um, a big campus on the lake, and then also a big campus up above uh, in, the, in the old farmstead. There are two large campgrounds on the lake and about 300 camps that ring the first tier development, increasingly becoming uh, year round homes. And then of course, we're beginning to get second and third tier development. So, um, it's been developed or overdeveloped for a long time. Let's see if I can do it this way. Um, my family has been on the lake for six generations, more than a hundred years. This picture dates to 1962, which is the year I was born. I probably shouldn't confess to that, but, um, and so uh, we're deeply, deeply rooted on the lake, deeply connected to generational experience, family memor memories. Um, I grew up playing in the wetlands, literally, uh, in rowboats and canoes, catching uh, frogs and fish. I learned to swim on the lake and water ski. I raised my children on the lake, and now my grandchildren come. So it's deeply personal for me. Um, and we're very lucky to have, uh, over the years, acquired five cottages in a cove. So we have a, you know, a, nice, a nice experience in the summer. So very embodied. Um, and the Lake Association has been around for a long time as well. It's gone through three iterations, probably each time uh, due to some concern like the drawdown of the, uh, the water levels. The most recent iteration uh, was sparked by conservation issues in the 90s. Uh, people were beginning to see that Maine wasn't going to escape the problems that other states are having with uh, issues like algal blooms and invasive plants. Um, I wasn't around at that point. Um, I started in the 2000s and I've been at various times a trustee, uh, a secretary, I've been on a number of committees. And at the moment we have an 11 member board of trustees and officers and you know, a number of subcommittees. Um, and <clears throat> our mission is to protect, enhance and preserve Lake Wessarunset and its watershed. Um, a few other things that I do is manage the courtesy boat inspection grant. That's a state run program where people, uh, you, you set up a, uh, an inspector to inspect boats coming in out of the lake to make sure they don't have invasive plants on them. Um, it's all voluntary and uh, it's a courtesy. And then I wear any a number of hats uh, in the organization, including grant writing and managing grants. Um, one of the questions that we that we grapple with that I think gets back to some of Katie's uh, models is, you know, what exactly is a lake association? And as it turns out, it does depend. Um, oops, press the button here. Um, 
the official definition is uh, a nonprofit organization incorporated under state law whose corporate purpose includes maintenance or improvement of water quality or public safety on a great pond. And a great pond is anything over 10 acres, any water body over 10 acres. Um, management of water levels or other social educational stewardship or advocacy efforts to benefit users of the natural environment of a great pond. Um, you know, and that's a serviceable definition, but of course, a, a lake association is much more dynamic than that. Um, and it is also um, perceived, uh, depending on uh, who is looking at it in very different ways. Uh, someone once said to me, a conservationist is someone who already owns a camp, <laughs> right? And so uh, that obviously implies that, um, you know, we care about our property values. Um, and we're thought of that way by many different ent entities. Towns think uh, lake associations are, are populated by rich people from away. Conservationists think it's people protecting their property rights. Um, it can be difficult to get people to join the lake association because they see us as the brass police. We're only there to police what they're doing on their shorefront. And that makes it hard sometimes to get funding and to get help. Um, and in fact, even though we are, I believe, the second largest tax base in the town of Madison, uh, they only give us annually $5,500 to support our lake efforts, most of, most of which goes to our uh, courtesy boat inspection program, which can cost upwards of $15,000 per year. So negotiating the definition of uh, lake association is something we do explicitly and implicitly and as the problems get greater and we need more help, uh, we continue to try to broaden our appeal. There we go. Um, so the 21st century really has ushered in wicked problems and you know they've come to main lakes. Uh, we now have algal blooms uh, and then we're kind of moving up the interstate uh, corridor. Um, this is a kind of famous picture. It's uh, the hydrilla monster. Uh, hydrilla was found in a couple of lakes in Maine. It may have been eradicated, but at quite a cost. So the most common uh, invasive plant is variable leaf milfoil, and we have it knocking at our door within five miles in a couple of areas on the Kennebec River. Um, algal blooms are becoming more per pervasive because of climate change and development, uh, non-source point pollution and other kinds of pollution. This is East Pond in the, Bear, in the Belgrades. Uh, they've actually cleaned this, uh, this bloom up with a $1.1 million al uh, alum treatment that won't be permanent. So you can see how expensive it is to have to mitigate. The best thing is prevention, which is what we're still in a position to be able to do. Um, Erosion is a problem with, with camp roads and poor development. It contributes to the algal blooms. Uh, we, this is a bucket biologist, somebody who maybe wants to fish for pike in a lake where pike doesn't exist, so they dump it in and then it takes over because it's incredibly aggressive um, and outcompetes native plants, I mean, native uh, fish. And there are um, other invasive animals that are knocking at our doors, including zebra mussels, something called a Chinese mystery snail, and even something called uh, rock snot, which is kind of a gross thing, like it sounds. Um, humans, which may be the most invasive species of all, um, continue to bring in uh, larger and more destructive boats. Jet skis can go up to 70 miles per hour. Uh, wake boats are incredibly destructive destructive and can swamp uh, loon nests. They cause erosion, uh, can reduce water quality and other kinds of problems. Um, and so, uh, you know, compound, uh, com compound the problems. Um, actually, boat strikes are rivaling uh, lead sinkers as the number one cause of death for loons. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah. So, of course, lake associations are increasingly on the front lines. We're the ones on the ground. And this is our lake association. Uh, the picture 
here is a, uh, a group of us about to go out and to do a plant survey to check for invasive plants in our lake. We do that yearly. And then this is our water quality monitor who uh, tests the water for water clarity, phosphorus levels, um, dissolved oxygen, color, and other things. Here's a list of some of the things that our 11 member board and a few extra volunteers accomplish each year. And I won't read it to you. I just want you to kind of see that we actually do get quite a lot done. Um, our biggest program is the courtesy boat inspection program, which is a, a season long program. Um, and we do not have 24 seven coverage. We just really cover the weekends. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we're really uh, preventing in, uh, invasive plants from coming, but a, a good point of, of this program is the educational value of it. So we do a lot. Um, and, you know, it looks idyllic, uh, but the circumstances under which we do our work is very messy. You know, it is iterative, recursive, nonlinear, personal. And, it's a support. You want me to keep going? Okay. <laughs> okay. So now the story, finally. Uh, this is uh, the what. So we developed a watershed conservation plan, and, and that's kind of the basis of our story. Uh, first, this is our lake here. Um, the lake runs roughly north to south. Um, on the northwest shore here is a you know beautiful complex of wetlands. Lakewood Theater Complex is down here. The art school is down at the bottom. Um, our boat landing, our public boat landing is here uh, and the outlet to the lake. And this is where that East Madison wool, uh, woolen mill was at one time. Um, uh, and so the point of this story really is to talk about the coalition building that we've done. And, um, a lot of it has been deliberate, but sometimes it's kind of the result of, of serendipity. So um, I've explained the, the layout of the watershed and um, I'm gonna start the story with actually a failure. So around mm, maybe 2005 or so, um, a former campground right here called the Totem Pole at the time, uh, the land at that site went up for sale. The Totem Pole stopped uh, operating and the owners wanted to sell the land. And the Lake Association um, decided that we would try to buy it. And uh, we failed at that time to buy it. And I won't go into a lot of details, but the, the main reason we failed um, was because we just really weren't prepared to buy, to, uh, to buy it at that time. The Lake Association had only been around for a few years and we hadn't built any partnerships. Um, and so, even though we got a little bit of help and some money from the art school and had um, some enthusiasm um, as I'm among the, um, the members of the association, uh, we, we had to give up on it because it just wasn't really time for us to do it. Um, and so the land sat there for a long time and fast forward to um, 2019, 2020, we decided to do it, to try again. Um, partly because of the specter of the wicked problems, we were beginning to be very worried about loon, the balloon population, um, some of the uh, you know, years without chicks and, and so on. So we formed a committee and uh, started to do our homework. And the first thing that we did was we brought in um, IFNW, IFNW to find out um, exactly what protections are afforded uh, the wetlands on the lake. And what we learned was really quite discouraging. So what you can see here in pink, um, this is uh, inland waterfowl and wading bird habitat designated by IFNW. So it gets extra protections, but we learned that those protections aren't necessarily permanent. They're very complicated. Um, and case in point, this wetland right here, um, which is, it's not showing, is it? I, okay, I'm gonna show it. So these are the, these are the wetlands. Um, and then this is a wetland right here that used to be um, pink like these, and then uh, got reevaluated and downgraded. So lost some of its protections. Sorry, I thought the, the cursor was working up there. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we, what we determined is that the only way we could protect the land was to buy it. 
Um, so we rolled up our sleeves and started to make some partnerships. Okay, so I'm wait this is where we're gonna have to start. Okay, so our partnerships um, included Somerset Woods trustees. Um, and we, so they agreed to hold any land that we purchased. Um, and we made a really good relationship with the art school. The director, Sarah Workner, sat on our board, our watershed conservation plan. And um, she uh, was really, really helpful. And then we um, hired a consultant, Jennifer Brockway, who became uh, Somerset Wood Trustees um, executive director. And she helped us uh, create our plan. So I'm gonna whip to the plan here because I just wanted to do the last little bit here. Um, so this is the plan that we created. Um, and it, so I think it's a clicker to work here. Uh, it has conservation goals and strategies. And we had five conservation targets, including the common loon. And we chose that one as the first one because the loon is kind of an indicator species. Um, that the loon is doing well, the lake is doing well. Um, we had conservation goals, strategies, specific strategies for each goal. So our goals for the loon were to ensure the habitat, the protection of the habitat, and to maintain the three nesting sites. Um, our strategy spanned 10 years because it's a 10 year plan. And then we categorized the different types of work that we did um, and brainstormed partners for the plan. Um, and then interestingly, of course, the plan hasn't gone to, as planned at all. Some of our other um, uh, targets include wetland systems, uh, natural resources, um, aquatic diversity, all things that help the ecology of the lake. Um, and you can see that our plan is very linear here. Uh, we wanna first understand and document the wetland and then um, make sure that the protections are being uh, uniformly applied and then achieve con permanent conservation. Um, but, uh, and, and so conservation wouldn't happen until four or ten, five years out. Um, but what wound up happening is that um, the pandemic land rush kind of happened and suddenly land became uh, available and uh, people were, you know, coming in from out of state, buying up land. And so Mainers were selling the land. So that wetland that I described before over here suddenly became for sale and we learned about it before it went on the market. And essentially, because we had put that coalition into place, we were able to act and purchase the land. And um, Sarah Workner from the art school actually uh, convinced her board to front the money for the land. And we were able to purchase it. It's at the headwaters of the lake. It's a really good, important piece for uh, conservation of the water quality. And it also has really, really wonderful features um, as well. So a little serendipity. Um, and a lot of hard work uh, allowed us to purchase it. Um, but again, that kind of messy stops and starts, uh, things not going according to the plan um, is kind of, uh, you know, speaks to, to that uh, mo uh, model of ecology. So I don't know if you want to should we zoom ahead to the takeaway? There's lots of great other examples. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> I didn't Elizabeth get that to. We'd be happy to talk about in the Q&A. Yeah, um, and I just wanted to do a shout out to my father who quickly, and then we'll move forward. He, um, he's been doing the water quality testing and the, um, the loon counts since the 80s. So before the latest iteration of the, of the, um, of the Lake Association, um, he had the vision for the land conservation and, you know, he really was the one that brought citizen science to our Lake Association um, and has allowed us to work. But we've had some other wonderful people who've brought other kinds of expertise as well, but I will all move ahead. Um, so what all these examples are attempting to show is all the different actors and factors that have gone into sustainability. That it's, it wasn't just the plan leading to this one thing, right? But it's, it, it's complicated, it's messy, but there's been serendipitous encounters. There's been lots of different ways at getting at sustainability beyond that sort of idea of this one linear, linear 
And I didn't know if you wanted to talk and, about and we've that. also um, had um, a parent and uh, a student, an undergraduate, UMaine student to be an intern with the Lake Association. And she produced this wonderful infographic map that is now on kiosks. I believe around the lake as sort of an educational outreach. So there was, it was a wonderful opportunity for a student who was in one of my English classes and then I connected her with Elizabeth. So again, it's sort of this like idea of an interdisciplinary approach, right? And we had a student who um, interned with the lake and we now currently have an English student interning here at the Mitchell Center, um, Sarah Del Monte, who's doing writing stories and web content. And so this again is sort of a nod to all of the different ways that collaborations, both big and small, uh, contribute to this work. And our strategies, takeaways, we, we've touched on and we can talk more about in the Q&A, negotiating differences, deliberating to define terms, embracing those chance encounters and that non-linear progress, building coalitions as Elizabeth talked so much about, and then also recognizing the affective and embodied experience of this hard work. Um, this is a quote from Elizabeth that I, and taking action even if small steps, and Elizabeth said to me in one of our, our meetings when we were doing this talk, it all takes time, openness, patience, patience hard work, and a little luck. Um, yeah, and the openness can be hard, right? Because you have your sort of framework and uh, it's hard to, to see other points of view. So it's something that I think our Lake Association has gotten uh, much better at with uh, some of the additions of the people I weren't able, wasn't able to bring in. Uh, who want want to broaden our our, our reach and our, um, our our way of being as a lake association? So, so I guess we can open it up for questions. Everyone, can we give them another hand? This was just so fantastic. This was just a, such a wonderful talk. Um, and if we followed you home from today. Um, what would we see? Would we see um, something that helps us think about sort of how do you do these amazing negotiations with people? How do you bring all these things in? How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> you could say that's a stupid question. That's fine. <laughs> You know, I th I've, I've been thinking about the idea that I'm so in the weeds that this has been a wonderful opportunity for me to, you know, pull back and think about it uh, in a larger perspective. So, um, you know, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but um, I think it's made me, doing this presentation has made me feel a lot more positive about the work because it can be frustrating it can feel like you're not getting anywhere, um, but it it is the fact that it's dynamic and you know three steps forward, two steps back um, that is really uh, you know just the nature of the beast, and you know you have to keep the faith, I guess. <laughs> That's just so. It really is so interesting, and people actually had a lot of questions about the Lake Association and how this all operated. Uh, and continues to operate that like how many members do you have someone was asking about membership dues um they they were um interested in the you know how often do you do you meet what's the what's going on and the kind of educational value um you certainly don't have to answer all those things but but i think one of the key takeaways maybe from this is uh, people are very interested in these associations and sort of what are they and what do they do? Well, I, I mean, I can literally answer some of those questions. We have roughly about 100 members, I believe, which is a small fraction of the people who use the lake. Um, so again, always trying to, to make a broader reach. Um, our dues are $35 a year, I believe. But we've created... so. One of the people that I didn't talk about was this uh, young woman, um, Amy Bonzel, who I think might have been something of a pandemic refugee. She spent 2020 on the lake. Her family is also has a long history on the lake, um, but she came to us as an expert in human-centered design. 
And so she was doing a lot of experimenting uh, with that, those concepts in community building on our lake. Um, and she is really trying to get people to be more interactive and for us to respond to, I think it was David's point, uh, meeting people where they are. So, you know, some people just want to be on the lake and have fun. They don't want to be worrying about conservation and, you know, always looking to make sure they're not near the loons or whatever. They just want to enjoy themselves. And so she's really uh, pushing us not to be so narrowly focused on just one aspect to make, to, to, to reach out and broaden the appeal. Um, so that, you know, that's a big, a big change for our lake. Um, and we meet um, monthly. Uh, we maybe don't meet so much in the winter. When we created the watershed conservation plan, we met every two weeks, the small committee, uh, for about a year and a half or two years to create that document, uh, which is a much longer document than the, the one page I showed you. Um, and so it depends on what we're doing. Hey, Linda, Thank could you. I have a turn in the room for a second? Sure. Okay, let's do this one first. Uh, yeah, could you uh, speak a little bit to the legal um, capabilities of a uh, lake association kind of in the community and especially with respect to conservation and implementing that? Like, is it like an HOA where you have that sort of layer of government governance over the lake or is it all just hey guys, please, let's, let's all agree to do this. That's a good question. It's kind of inspired by your use of the term grass police. I was yeah, wondering how police it yeah. gets. Yeah, so we have no power. Okay. Um, and, and uh, awesome. you know, but we have, you know, influence in other ways, um, and, but we, we don't have any power over what people do. There are uh, zoning laws and there are regulations for, you know, there's the Natural Resources Protection Act, there's shoreland zoning. So there are rules about what people can do. And I think we're called the grass police because you know sometimes we might make a phone call if we see something irregular, right? Okay, um, but all those rules like come from on high, they're not your rules. No, yeah, the town would enforce them or the state. And cool. something we were talking about actually right before the talk is even some of those rules at more of the town level are not always followed, right? Like things right. like zoning and building, that those rules are in place, but people find ways to get around them. So something that we've been talking a lot about is sort of, and I think this speaks to our talk, you know, you have these big potential plans or laws or rules, and then you have what actually happens. And I think it seems to me like that's where the Lake Association is really on the ground, right? And so mm -hmm. they've done some really creative ways, I think, to educate folks. You know, the, the rule might be there, like, you know, you can't <laughs> build this close to the water or whatever, but if people don't know about that rule or if they're not following it, Elizabeth has a lot of stories of ways that the Lake Association is sort of getting creative in communicating that, because even if it exists, doesn't mean that people know about it or that they're gonna follow it. Yeah, and as property turns over and new people come in, you know, they have their own ideas about what should be done on the lake. And, and so um, you can't. You mentioned uh, student involvement and um, uh, college student involvement. Is there grade school or middle school or high school involvement? Could there be opportunities where people would be transformed by being involved um, at an earlier age? So that's a great question. And we have talked a lot about that. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, that's another, you know, I'm going to mention Amy Bonzel, uh, idea that uh, one of her sacrificial ideas that came from her, um, that we should try to involve younger people. Um, and you probably didn't see the picture of the, the men putting in the kiosk, but the average age was, oh, you know, yeah. maybe just a little over 25. <laughs> no, but, you know, it's a, it's a gray-haired organization for sure. Uh, and so Amy is, you know, probably in her 30s or 40s and way much younger than the rest of us. Um, mm -hmm. so. Linda, can I have a turn again? You betcha. We'll do this back and forth a couple times. <laughs> Um, the uh, the poster, I guess, is that what you'd call it that you've got presented? How many of them are there around the lake? You've got them in a couple key locations, or uh... so again, it, it's it's around the idea of invasive aquatic plants. Sure, and they are spread by boats. 
primarily. I got you. Um, so at access points around the lake, we uh, got permission to put up kiosks with information on it. So we have one at the public landing. Um, we have one at the two campgrounds. Those are private access points. So you've got them spread and around. And one at Lakewood, yeah. Well, well then, I mean, to me, that lens that you've got, and you don't need a big sample size, but uh, if somebody's out, like everything's got a clock ticking on it. So that poster does too, like for a refresh and, and getting some feedback as to what somebody who knows nothing thinks of that. You know, and then also you no know, QR codes are used a lot to drop things on people. And, and you know, having that as a swipe, you know, if somebody has that they can put on their phone. That's a you, great idea. So what an awesome we're idea. signing you up. Uh, <laughs> and I was I was a water district trustee for the Portland Water District uh, uh, for a number of years. And so I've just seen a lot of tricks. There's only 2000 camps around Sebago Lake and a lot. And, 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 you know, one of the things, what, what was the title of the talk? Uh, competing interests or uh, differences. So there's a lot of differences around Sebago Lake. And so I was, just, uh, I was curious, but it all comes down to a small, working through small, and, and so thank you yeah. for your. Yeah. And I think that those are some great ideas. And I think Elizabeth and I have had other conversations about, as we were setting up the student intern, Ship associated with the Lake Association. We had a lot of conversations about the labor that it takes to create those kind sure. of documents and posters. And I think involving students as interns has been yeah. really helpful because it's hard to just get those ideas implemented. Um, and you know, students who are interested in sustainability, conservation, technical communication, those are really great opportunities to get them involved. Um, so that poster that you saw was the direct result of an internship. And so we're hoping to continue that in the future just for more hands on deck, so to say. So the good news is um, we have lots more interest here than there with questions, but the bad news is we're pretty close to being out of time. I'm going to invite folks in the room to come up and ask their questions. Linda, do you have a final thing you want to do there? Yeah, final one. And first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for this great talk. You, you did such important um, talking about coalition building and the ways that it is exciting and important and troubling. What's the oddest experience you've had doing that that we can all go home thinking about and how we would go about this process? Did you say the hardest or the oddest? Oddest, oddest. It could be the hardest, but the <laughs> oddest. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I'm sort of, I'm not supposed to really be talking about this yet because it hasn't happened, but one of the, the, the great <laughs> things is that success seems to breed success. So we're actually in the process possibly of conserving more land. And the whole point of that story was that, you know, we were going to do all our homework and then conserve land. And now suddenly, you know, we're doing that ahead of, of time. Um, and, and the oddest thing is that one of the members of our Lake Association just happened to have a, a little uh, cottage that she rents out and uh, a couple who inherited some land on the lake just happened to stay there. And she just caught wind of this from them just by something they said. And uh, from that odd little serendipitous experience, uh, suddenly we're on the verge of possibly conserving a really important piece of that Western shoreland because um, they're really awesome, good people, and uh, you know they oh, nice. they want to. That's wonderful. For us. So I think that was really an odd experience. Thank you, thank you, both of you, for this Thanks just so wonderful much. talk.